My Lords, I beg to move motion A that this House does not insist on its amendment for L, to which the Commons have disagreed for their reason for M. My Lords, I want to express my thanks once again to everyone for their contributions to this important debate. The other, the other place has now consistently voted against four different amendments on the issue of remediation, an issue that is vitally important, but it is not for this Bill. My Lords, you have a choice about whether to prioritise finalising this important Bill or delay it to the point where it falls. The Government's position on the Fire Safety Bill has not changed. I will repeat our crucial key points. We are all in agreement about the importance of getting the Fire Safety Bill on the statute book. Residents have a right to be safe and feel safe in their homes. As I have said repeatedly, without this Bill, the legal ambiguity around the Fire Safety Order will continue. Let me be clear about what, it, what is at stake if we do not resolve this. Responsible persons for multi-occupied residential buildings can continue to argue that it is lawful to ignore uh, this, um, the, ignore the fire safety risks of the structure, external walls and flat entrance doors. Fire and rescue services will lack the legal certainty to support enforcement decisions taken to keep people safe. Failure to get this bill to the statute books will lead to a delay in delivering the Grenfell recommendations. This is not a political point. This bill must come first as it, is the, as it, is, as it provides the legal certain, certainty that I have just referred to. That certainty will enable the Secretary of State to make regulations with reduced risk of challenge, to place duties on responsible persons in relation to the external wall structure and flat entrance doors as the inquiry recommended. It might help to provide an example. The inquiry recommended a frequency of checks on fire safety doors, including flat entrance doors and communal f fire doors. Well, you can't do that easily and be relatively free from legal risk if we have not identified that flat entrance doors are within the scope of the fire safety order. Equally, enforcing authorities would not be able to take appropriate action in this regard. I thank your Lordships for recognising the substantial government support to the tune of 5.1 billion in place for leaseholders uh, with regard to the remediation of unsafe cladding. Our five-point plan to bring an end uh, to this cladding crisis helps to provide certainty to the housing market. Noble Lords yesterday raised some points about uncertainty in the housing market and concerns of lenders and insurers. Our five-point plan addresses this. More does need to be done to ensure that those responsible for fire safety defects should contribute to paying for the costs of remediation. Industry must play, must play its part and pay their way, and through our high-rise levy and developer tax, we will make sure that developers with the broader shoulders pay their contribution. I agree that leaseholders need stronger avenues for address, and I made that very clear yesterday. The Building Safety Bill will bring forward measures to do this, including making directors as well as companies liable for prosecution. We are bringing about the biggest changes in a generation to the system through the Building Safety Bill. Finally, I would also like to reiterate my comments uh, yesterday, um, which I also made yesterday, regarding forfeiture. It is a draconian measure that should be used only as a last resort, and this mass measure should be considered as part of our wider programme on leasehold reform. I beg to move. The question is that motion A be agreed to. I next call Lord Kennedy of Southwark to move motion A1. Uh, my Lords, um, firstly I draw the attention of the House to my relevant interests as a Vice President of the Local Government Association, a non-executive director of MHS Homes Limited and the chair of the Heart of Medway Housing Association. It is um, disappointing and, and frankly outrageous that the government are doing nothing and not delivering on their promises to the innocent victims of the cladding scandal. 
uh, the Noble Lord of Greenhouse has gone through um, various points, and um, he made the point the other players have consistently voted against our amendments, and I think that's a matter of much regret on the other places' part. Personally, um, it doesn't seem to me that the uh, members of, of the governing party are recognising, or most of them are recognising, the plight of the innocent victims in this scandal. Um, it just what also really irritates me about this, it is the point that my neighbourhood Lord Adonis made, is that the Governor now saying to us, well, of course, you know, the session finishes tomorrow, we need to get on the books. The fact is, the Government left this, when the House rejected these amendments some weeks ago, and they left them sitting there and didn't bring them here. They could have done. I don't know if that's deliberate or incompetent, but the fact is, it just sat there and they weren't brought here. And, and then, then, then to claim that oh, we, we can't go any further because, of course, where we are is irritating, to, to say the least. And, uh, you know, and I think it's fair to say you could never accuse this government of acting in haste when it comes to the Grenfell Tower inquiry recommendations. This is the first bit of legislation. I think the, the fire was four, it will be four years uh, this summer, so they can't, so they can't act in, in haste at all. And, the noble lord is right. Of course, we want, I want to see that the people who built defective buildings, who put cladding on improperly, you know, pay. What I don't want to see is the innocent victims pay. I also want the insurance companies that gave insurances to actually honour their honest, honour those. They were clearly happy to provide the insurance, but they should actually pay up. I also want to see the professionals who sign buildings off, you know, again through their professional indemnity insurance, um, come forward and actually recognise and actually be held to account for what they've done. But I think it's even more outrageous when you look at the comments of our Prime Minister, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, what he's been saying over the last 18 months. And I'm going to remind how just one or two quotes from the Prime Minister, not all of them, there's absolutely loads, but just one or two, the words of our Prime Minister are said the issue. There are many examples, and I would, I would suggest, particularly members of the government, government benches, would do well to reflect on some of the comments of the Prime Minister, to read what he said, think about those remarks, and then think about what they've done or are doing in terms of the votes that they're whipped to do. One just comment, comment. I know that progress is not as fast as I should like, but I'm pleased to say that all such buildings covered by central government have now had their cladding removed. I understand work to remove it or, at the very least, have such work scheduled. In the private sector, progress is slower, and too many building owners have not acted responsibly. That was the Prime Minister on the 30th of October 2019. 2019. Or when he said, my honourable friend is absolutely right to draw attention to the injustice and what is happening with leaseholders at the moment. That's why we put forward 1.6 billion to remove unsafe cladding. I do not want to see leaseholders being forced to pay for remediation. And I can assure my honourable friend that we are looking now urgently before the expiry of the current arrangements and, and what we can do to take them forward and support leaseholders who are in a very unfair position. That was the Prime Minister on the 9th of December 2020. Or we are determined that no leaseholder should have to pay for unaffordable costs or fixing safety defects that they did not cause and are of no fault to their own. Agree, agree, everyone agree with that. Everyone agree with that. That was the reply from the Prime Minister to the leader of opposition on the 3rd of February this year. And that's just three. There are many, many other quotes you can all look at. But those are the quotes, and then we come back to the reality of where we are. And the reality is something different, isn't it, my Lords? And it goes on and on. And what is shocking for me is that whenever the government had been provided with the means, through the Fire Safety Bill, to do what they promised, what the Prime Minister promised, they voted against it. We get excuse after excuse after excuse from the Noble Lord of Greenhouse or from at the other end. Why the Prime Minister can't do this, why the government can't deliver on their promises, their promises. And frankly, some excuses are feeble. It's not the right bill is regularly trotted out. Well, I've been in this House for 11 years, and I have seen some dreadful bills from the government, absolutely dreadful bills. Look at the dreaded Housing and Planning Act. 
appalling legislation, poorly put together on the back of a cigarette packet, pushed forward by then Prime Minister David Cameron, only to be dumped virtually completely by Theresa May when she assumed office. Or the useless Fixed Term Harbour Act that proved to be totally pointless and delivered nothing. Or the ridiculous decision not to go for higher building standards of homes to make them carbon neutral, only then a couple of years later, a complete reverse position and actually want to do that. Or the rogue laws land landlord's database, which the government refused, refused repeatedly to let the public have access to, only then to change their mind but say, we're really sorry, we can't find the time to actually make the change. So I fully respect the conventions of this House. I also fully respect the primacy of the other place. But that does not prevent us from, from keep raising this scandal to speak up for the innocent victims, and they are the innocent victims, the people who play by the rules, pay their taxes, pay their council tax, go to work, work hard, and expect better from their government. And they're not getting that today. So this issue is not going to go away. We will, in this House and in the other place, confront the government with the reality of their absurd position. With the victims of this scandal, we will, we will force the government to honour its promises and pledges. People in this country have had their eyes opened to the actions of the Prime Minister and his government, and they are not going to be fooled by all the pledges, promises and, 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 and desire to do things that then actually do nothing. Yes, we finally found out, and the country found you out. I beg to move. The question is that motion A1, as an amendment to motion A, be agreed to. My Lords, I should inform the House that if motion A1 is agreed to, I cannot call motion A2. I call now Baroness Pinnock to speak to motion A2. My Lords, uh, I remind the House of my interests as a Vice President of the Local Government Association and as a member of Kirkley's Council. My Lords, Throughout the course of this bill, I have said that I support its contents and purpose. What I cannot support are the unintended consequences which will have a devastating impact on individual leaseholders and will have a very damaging effect on the housing market. Those are the reasons for my asking again for the government to take responsibility for the consequences of this bill, which, despite the noble Lord the Minister's best efforts, has been totally underwhelming so far. Promises have been made by the government and not kept. The government's response to date is to provide grant funding of £5 billion, while knowing that the total cost is estimated at £16 billion. The grant only includes those blocks over 18 metres and only removes the flat flammable cladding. For those in lower blocks, there is the prospect of paying up to £50 per month for years to come. Conveniently, the government fails to take into account the non-cladding issues, which are a result of a construction failure of immense proportions. These non-cladding issues are the ones which will finally push individuals over the edge. Meanwhile, those who have literally built this catastrophe walk away with their billions of profit. The government has a duty to protect its citizens. It is its prime duty. Yet here we are today with perhaps a million of our fellow citizens being thrown to the ravages of financial bankruptcy and the government washes its hands and looks the other way. The government will argue that the bill is a vital response to the Grenfell tragedy. It's so vital that it has taken four years to get to the statute book. The bill's purpose is to include 
external walls, doors and balconies into the fire safety order of 2005 so that action is taken to protect people from another Grenfell tragedy. However, a bill is not now needed to force action to remove cladding, that is happening. It is not needed to get fire alarms put in, that is happening. Those who own the building and those who are, who are leaseholders and tenants already know now that action has to be taken to make their building safe. It is no longer urgently necessary to get legislation to force the issue. And it is no longer able to force construction firms to take the necessary action. There is not capacity to do so. If though, if though the bill does fall, it provides a breathing space for the government to develop a package of further measures that will protect the interests of leaseholders and save them from penury. The amendment in my name seeks to achieve that breathing space. The amendment is based on that of the noble prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, original one, and as it has been adjusted to include the various very valid points that have been made during the passage of this bill. What we all must recognise is that passing this bill will not magic away the crisis that individual leaseholders are facing. It won't remedy the construction scandal. It won't provide stability for a floundering housing market. It will be the beginning of a scandal of individual bankruptcies, homelessness, of intense stress and mental illness. It will become a public scandal. And I, for one, will at least have on my conscience that I, I have done all in my power to prevent it. Leaseholders have done everything right and nothing wrong. Liberal Democrats will stand by them. My Lords, I give notice that I wish to test the opinion of the House on the amendment in my name. <coughs> the Earl of Lytton. My Lords, as we seem to be in the last chance saloon, I will try not to repeat myself too much, but declare my interests uh, both as a property professional and as a vice president of the LGA. Now, as I said yesterday, we seem to be presented by the government with a choice. On the one hand, the evident desirability of implementing fire safety measures in pursuance of the valuable recommendations of, in, the, in the report of Dame Judith Hackett into the Grenfell tragedy plus a partial solution to some of the effects of cladding replacement on a limited class of taller buildings, as we have heard. On the other, I'm afraid I must describe it as the effective hanging out to dry of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of other homeowners. It should not be a question of either or in dealing with a growing and pressing social and economic disaster. I too support improved fire safety, but not based on the basis of creating further untold and probably unquantified problems. Yesterday, the minister endeavoured to persuade us by saying that um, this brief and simple bill merely clarified the regulatory reform fire safety order 2005. I'm afraid to say that on my own rereading of that, it is plainly mistaken. This bill amends the scope of the fire safety order by inserting an exception to para one little a, referring in turn to two newly inserted paras one capital A and one capital B, which substantially expand the scope of the order. The fact that anything attached to the named elements 
means it has, has far wider implications than might be supposed. So I'm afraid to say the minister's assertion really did it for me. I felt that it was misleading and what my late father would have described as an exercise in intellectual sharp practice. So my distinctive impression is that I am being taken for some sort of fool. But the indisputable fact that this bill, it is this bill that makes the changes, that by direct chain of causation have created the issues and caused the results which the noble Baroness Lady Pinnock and the noble Lord Lord Kennedy seek to resolve must be regarded as plain. Another issue is that there appears to be one of definition. With the government concerned that in any scheme it might put in place, it could be used to avoid regular maintenance and routine upgrades. Uh, the noble Baroness Lady Pinnock's amendment in particular seeks to address that. In my experience, there may be gray areas, but I don't have any difficulty in my work in distinguishing repairs and the like uh, for, from, uh, uh, or like-for-like or -like replacements from those items which are improvements, and nor do most leaseholders and property owners. Let us be clear, and here I take my, uh, a cue from the noble Lord, Lord Kennedy, for a bit of historical background, but it was on the watch of a Conservative government that the 1984 Building Act brought in the approved inspector regime and the effective privatisation of the regulatory oversight of construction quality previously exercised by local authority building control. And despite indicators of shortcomings and shortcutting, it, this process continued without adequate checks on who was doing the inspection of the works or how good the oversight was in practice. And it is on the basis of the subsequent 37 years of construction and its legacy of known and unknown deficiencies scattered randomly about the nation's housing stock that modern house building, construction warranties, lending and home ownership have been founded. If the government considers it needs to take steps to protect uh, the valiant and much abused postmasters from system failure, then how can it with any cogency or conscience make a distinction concerning a far, far greater number of homeowners who are affected at least as severely? So whilst I note that the minister in the other place this afternoon sought to point the finger at the unelected lords blocking the democratic decision of the Commons, I'd simply say that the exercise of raw political power vis-a-vis -vis the party whip to procure a majority in the lobby does not endow the government with a moral superiority or indeed the social advancement of justice and ethical treatment of systems. And I note the reasons for rejecting our amendments, which simply translate as too difficult. My Lords, I suspect not half as difficult as picking up the bits after this has rolled itself out. At one point, I believe the government had it in hand to corral all the potential damage, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but I believe it has not done so. And I have to say this, I, it would not concern me if this bill fell. So unreasonable do I do believe its true effects to be, and so lacking in willingness of the government to deal with it. What it has proposed will roll out far too slowly. Eight months to do the highest uh, risk buildings. How much longer to deal with the more, uh, the, the far greater number in future stages? And what about capacity in terms of manpower, training, and so on? So whilst I took note of the uh, noble Lord, Lord Colmack's comments earlier this evening, I do find that sitting on my hands or signifying my acceptance of the government's position here does not sit comfortably with my conscience, knowing, as I do from professional knowledge, just what harm the bill is likely to do alongside its undoubted good. I suspect the bill will ultimately pass into law, even if the Parliament Act has to be invoked, but I'm afraid I cannot agree to it as it stands. I fear that lobby fatigue may, be, may mean that this is the end of the matter for now. Either way, I shall be returning to this in the new session, as doubtless will the noble Lord Lord Kennedy and the noble Baroness Lady Pinnock. But meanwhile, I have absolutely no hesitation in supporting 
the thrust of these amendments, uh, either one of them, whichever might gain approval. And I hope I will sleep with my conscience clear uh, as a result. Thank you. My Lords, I have, um, uh, about the, uh, the following members in the chamber have indicated that they wish to speak. Baroness Fox of Buckley, the Lord Bishop of Rochester, and the Noble Lord, Lord Newby. And I call first Baroness Fox of Buckley. I remind the House of my interests. I'm a leaseholder. Uh, following on from the Noble uh, Lord Kennedy of Southwark, I too uh, heard in February Boris Johnson telling Parliament that no leaseholder should have to pay for the unaffordable costs of fixing safety defects that they didn't cause and are no fault of their own. And to be honest, I cheered. Maybe I was being naive, but uh, I sort of took him at his word. And I sort of still do. But can I? I mean, has anyone briefed the Prime Minister on how his promise to leaseholders is being broken by his own government as we speak? In the other place, the Minister, Chris Pincher, said that the amendments lack clarity and that they prohibit minor costs from being passed on to leaseholders. And I just felt that was so disingenuous. I mean, this is not a load of whiny leaseholders whinging about minor costs. They're utterly desperate. And, my Lords, this bill almost guarantees, as we've heard from other noble Lords, that there will be major costs passed on to them. That's unless the Minister thinks that remediation of up to tens of thousands of pounds each or 400% hikes in service charges are minor. Well, not in my world and not in the world of so many leaseholders who, as I've stressed here before, bought into that nirvana of homeowning democracy, often first-time buyers who become leaseholders as part of affordable housing schemes. The minister in the other place said that the amendment won't help leaseholders, but leaseholders don't feel that way. And in fact, what they do feel is exasperated. They've been told that the loan scheme and things will, uh, to the, that this issue can be sorted out with the passage of the Building uh, Safety Bill. But even then, if there was an assurance from the government that they would prioritise that Building Safety Bill as an urgent piece of legislation at the start of the first session, it might be some consolation. But of course, we don't know when it will be. And as one group of leaseholders have noted in an email to me, the reality is that they are accruing costs now. They are not allowed to postpone paying those costs until a new parliamentary session. They can't say, sorry, won't pay until the building safety bills got through. And they fear that by the time that legislation is passed, many of them will already have lost their homes. And as one said, I will have certainly lost my mind. Earlier today, I heard a government minister here justify imposing a set of regulations on the Northern Irish Assembly, despite that undermining the devolution agreement. And the minister justified the decision because it said that the government had a duty to ensure that women's rights were addressed and that legal services for abortion were made available. I was anxious at this procedural and technical fix to solve a complex constitutional and moral problem. But now, if only the government would come up with some procedural and technical fix to solve what is undoubtedly a complex problem, but in this instance of leaseholders' rights. And it just seems a certain stubbornness that's so unbecoming, a kind of invasiveness that is kicking this problem down the road and it will get worse and letting the most blameless take the hit in the meantime. I feel as though the minister here, who I have a lot of respect for, I feel as though the government must know in their heart of hearts that what Tory rebels in the other place and lords from all sides of this house are, and all of the devastating personal testimonies that we've shared with you over the last few days, I think you must know that what's being asked for here is modest. Any mechanism, however technical, any scheme that would actually help leaseholders and save them from bankruptcies now 
so urgently needed. And I know we've heard about the five billion scheme and we've all welcomed it, but it really only applies to those in buildings over 18 metres. But leaseholders in buildings of 17 metres or 15 metres are still being asked to pay sky high costs. And it's estimated, as we've already heard, that the five billion scheme still leaves at least 10 billion unaccounted for and maybe more. So I just want to test whether the government are true to their word, true to the Prime Minister's word that I started with, and ask the Minister a simple question. If this fire safety bill were to pass in the interim between it passing and the building safety bill, what are the government going to do to stop leaseholders' bankruptcies and the negative equity crisis that this bill undoubtedly is helping to create? And I want to finally take the opportunity to let leaseholders know that you have allies in the other place and here, allies who will continue to stand up for you and keep raising awareness of your plight. And I'm still hopeful that the Minister and the Prime Minister might be those allies too. The Lord Bishop of Rochester. My Lords, the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans and Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of London have both been involved in earlier stages on this bill and neither is able to be in Your Lordship's house this evening, regretfully. I do come, however, with my own background and interest as a former board member of various housing associations over 25 years and as the former chair of the charity Housing Justice. My Lords, the Bishop of St Albans has already been noted by Lady Pinnock has been heavily involved in this matter and has been, I think, um, persistent. And he said yesterday, I think, that none of us wanted to be in this position at this stage. But while so much of this bill is welcome, not least the £5 billion, which has already been referred to, there are continuing and serious concerns, some of which have already been expressed in this debate this evening, about the position of leaseholders and tenants, and particularly certain groups of leaseholders and tenants. Yes, remediation is a complex matter, but I'm sure it's not so complex that it can't be worked out. And I do want to believe that Her Majesty's Government is sincere in the expressed desire to protect leaseholders and tenants. Proposed amendments, including uh, one here tonight, are designed to provide time for the government to bring forward its own statutory scheme. And it is the absence of clarity about that scheme and the timetable for it which is the cause of continuing regret on these benches. Mention has been made already of the loan scheme and in relation to buildings under 18 metres and the fact that that is likely to come forward in the context of another bill. But of course that leaves open the questions of the detail and of the time scale. and as the noble lady has just observed, there are leaseholders facing those bills today. My Lords, we have heard many uh, tragic stories of people with unpayable bills, with crippling insurance and service charges, and one of the things which concerns members of these benches is the effects of all of that on people's health and well-being, as well as on their financial capacity. These are important matters. They affect people's daily lives. They affect people's mental state. They affect their financial futures. And while this bill does tackle a number of really important things, it leaves open some others which leave people facing uncertainty and potentially significant, very significant liabilities. My Lords, whatever happens this evening, I know that many in this place and elsewhere will continue to make the cause because this issue will not go away. And I dare to hope that if this bill does pass this evening, that Her Majesty's Government will bring forward their proposals as soon as possible in the new session in order to remove the uncertainty from those who are finding it really difficult to live with that. From these benches, we continue to hold out hope for a more empathetic attitude towards leaseholders. Lord Newby. My Lords, I begin by declaring... Uh, my interest as a leaseholder affected by fire safety remediation costs. <clears throat> my Lords, I decided this afternoon to listen 
uh, to the debate uh, on this bill in another place uh, to see whether I'd been missing something um, by just hearing debates here uh, about the government's real reasons uh, for not taking any appropriate action. Instead of which, I found that the key challenges which have been set out by um, noble laws this evening were being made most eloquently by conservative backbenchers. So Bob Blackman made the absolute key point that leaseholders have no luxury of time, no luxury of time to deal with the demands that are dropping on their doormats today. Sir Robert Neal made the logical, consequential point that what was needed were bridging provisions to fund remediation until the government had put in place measures to recoup the costs from developers and builders. Costs to be met in the interim by the government. He also made the very telling point as a former minister that the government would have had time to produce its own amendments if it had put its mind to it. The response from the government was um, by the Right Honourable uh, Christopher Pincher, who replied uh, with all the empathy and grace of a Victorian mill owner being faced by workers' demands to install expensive safety equipment on all the machinery. He also put the noble Lord Lord Greenhouse to shame in his ability to ape Sir Humphrey. Unlike the noble Lord, who at least shows a certain degree of um, uh, lack of conviction about some of the adjectives used, Christopher Pincher had none. He said in describing this amendment, as we've heard before, that the uncertainty that it would cause, the lack of clarity, the litigation that would flow, would be voluminous. He had us almost in tears at the prospect of all these terrible, terrible consequences. But there was literally not a word of explanation as to why, given that the government allegedly wants to do what is right, that they had made no progress whatsoever in bringing forward their own proposals to deal with the issues now in the seven months since this bill's second reading. There wasn't from him a scintilla of a suggestion of when there would be certainty for leaseholders. The building safety bill would be brought forward, he said, and I quote, as quickly as possible, and it would protect leaseholders, and I quote, as far as possible. My lords, those are two statements which are of literally no comfort to somebody facing a bill today. We all know that those phrases, that phrase, as far as or as quickly as possible, allows the government to do whatever it wants and indeed not to do anything very much at all. He also had the temerity to say that the bill should now pass to, and I quote, let people get on with their lives, close quote. <laughs> the one thing which is certain is if this bill passes unamended, hundreds of thousands of people will not be able to get on with their lives yeah, yeah. Yeah. because the overwhelming uncertainty which will remain in terms of their financial position and in terms of th their ability, if they wish to do so, to sell the property in which they live. The truth is, my lords, that the government has shown itself indifferent to the mental and financial anguish faced by these people today, or else they would have made some meaningful commitments as to the timetable for lifting the burden of costs and uncertainty from them. In these circumstances, my lords, how can we, how can we in all conscience, just pack up our tents now and let this bill sail into the night? We on these benches will not do so, and I urge members across the House to vo vote for my noble friend's amendment to bring the relief to tenants which they so richly deserve. Here, here, here. Uh, uh, my lords, the noble lord of donors has also indicated a wish to speak, and I call him now. Uh, my lords, in um, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Humpty Dumpty says, uh, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. 
The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that is all. And that is exactly the position we find ourselves in today. Uh, it's an argument about the meaning of words, which the noble Lord, Lord Newby, in an excellent speech, has just pointed up. If you took the government's statements and sought to give the usual meaning to the words, then there wouldn't be a problem here this evening. I noted down what Lord uh, Greenhouge said in his opening remarks. He said, these are just some of the statements he made. Uh, my writing isn't fast enough to recite his whole speech, but uh, if you took his whole speech, you'd think that there was no disagreement between us at all. More needs to be done, he said. Industry must play its part and play, pay their way, he said. I agree, he said, that leaseholders need more protection. Forfeiture, he said, and, and the fact that we're talking about forfeiture is a sign of quite what, how serious a crisis we're facing. Forfeiture, he said, is a draconian measure which, and my writing wasn't fast enough here, but I think, I think he said, which is to be discouraged. Um, he also said, as Lord Newby just said, that these measures would be further addressed in the fire safety bill. Now, my lords, all of those statements which the noble lord made go to the heart of the protection which we have been seeking to provide for all of those categories of people affected, not just those who live in buildings of more than 18 metres and not just those with, uh, with costs directly attributable to cladding, if they fall in the category of remediation costs, which are essentially post-Grenfell. This is the key point, because of assessments that have been made about fire risk, which aren't just restricted to cladding, are in the wider areas, some of which are in the expanded fire safety order, which the minister referred to. So, my lords, the issue then is whether the scheme which the government has said that it will introduce to implement the principles which the minister himself has, has set out to the House this evening is adequate to the task. We take the minister at his word that it will be adequate to the task. There is uh, some disagreement about how far it needs to be legislative and how far not legislative, though the fact that he constantly refers to the Building Safety Bill leads us to think that it will be substantially legislative. But insofar as it's not legislative, these measures could be put in a legislative form, or he could make a categoric statement about when the government will come forward with a comprehensive scheme. So, so far, so good. So what happens, my lords, is the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, and his uh, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his understudy is here this evening, if I may so describe him. I mean, we, we, yeah, but anyway, he's, 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 he seems to be maintaining the line of the Right Reverend uh, Prelate, the Bishop of Lord. The Right Reverend Prelate and other noble lords then consistently, on about now ten occasions during the course of the bill, have come forward with proposals to put into legislative form what the government has told us themselves they want to do. And what happens, my lords, because we're now back into Alice in Wonderland, is that we pass amendments saying that remediation costs should not be passed on to leaseholders, uh, uh, which are attributable to, uh, uh, to the additional uh, costs which have come post Grenfell. And then the government comes along and says, ah, they say, but this doesn't take account of the following five concerns, we're told. Their concerns, which uh, the noble Baroness Lady Fox just mentioned, about small costs. Their concerns about defining costs. Their concerns about costs which might be attributable to leases which are applied and which tenants willingly engaged in before there are any additional costs put forward. Uh, we, we have a whole list of issues that are raised. And so what then happens, my lords, is that the ever... Um, um, uh, the ever... Um, uh, uh, receptive Bishop of St Albans and other noble lords change the amendments to take account of the government's own concerns. Um, indeed, the amendment which the noble lady Baroness Pinnock has moved this evening meets uh, most of the concerns which have been raised by Christopher Pincher in the House of Commons and the noble lord, Lord Greenhouge, here. I mean, it's worth dwelling on this, because these are hugely important issues affecting uh, potentially millions of people, my lord, so we ought to be clear about it. Her sub-clause 1 says that the owner of the building may not pass on the cost of remediation work attributable to the provisions of this Act, so defining clearly what, uh, uh, 
uh, what should and shouldn't apply. Uh, Subclause 2 says that the, uh, the, uh, the prohibition on remediation costs being passed on to tenants will only have effect until a statutory scheme is in operation, which ensures that leaseholders and tenants of dwellings are not required to pay more than £50 per month during the course of the lease. But it does not apply to a cost that is permitted under a lease or tenancy agreement that was made before this Act is passed and does not exceed £500, whether as a one-off cost or in a total cost across a 12-month period. Now, th this, my lords, meets the concerns which the Minister has raised unless he is not proposing to bring forward a scheme which actually meets his own commitments in due course, which is the reason why we go round in circles again. Now, my lords, this then comes uh, out of Alice in Wonderland and into the real world. In the real world, my lords, we all know what's happening. I mean, it's not a secret to those of us who are politicians what arguments have been happening now for two months. Two things are happening. First of all, a battle royal is going on between the Noble Lords Department and the Treasury about what costs the Treasury will meet and how narrowly defined these need to be. Uh, the Treasury is already concerned about the size of the uh, Fire Safety Fund, the 5.1 billion fund which the Noble Lord has referred to, and whether in fact the costs even under that scheme will end up being significantly higher. They certainly don't want more costs to be recognised. And the second thing that is, is, is going on, which we're all well aware of, is that though the government says, because of course there are huge numbers of um, people who are affected by this, many of them first-time buyers, many of them people who have under conservative schemes have bought um, uh, council properties and their leaseholders. Though the government says it wants to see them fully protected, it doesn't actually at the moment either have a plan for fully protecting them, nor to be absolutely blunt, does it want to fully protect them any more than it thinks is politically necessary to get through uh, the passage of, of this and subsequent legislation and presumably in the run-up to this next election in a judgment that it makes about uh, the salience of the issue. So, my Lords, we then come to the role of this House, which is unusual in this case, because it certainly is the case. We had a lecture from the Chief Whip earlier about the supremacy of the House of Commons, which we're all, uh, uh, we all um, uh, 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 recognise. But the supremacy of the House of Commons, my Lords, in, in this instance, is qualified in two respects. The Salisbury Convention is clear that the supremacy of the House of Commons applies to all matters which a government has placed in its manifesto. This, government, this House does not seek to cut across clear manifesto commitments which the government has made when it wants to realise them. The government's commitment that it made at the last election was to sort out this issue. It wasn't not to sort out this issue. So if we take that reading of the role of this House, we would actually be, be implementing the Salisbury Convention this evening if we pass uh, Lady Pinnock's amendment, because what we're seeking to do is to hold the government to its manifesto and the commitments it made to the people and not against them. But the other reason why we're uh, back in Alice in Wonderland in respect of the role of this House, my Lords, is that when the Noble Lord says, and he said this evening, and the Chief Whip said, that the bill would fail, the bill would only fail if, in response to this amendment being carried, the government chose to let it fail rather than accept an amendment which actually puts into law the very commitments which they themselves have said that they propose to meet. So, my Lords, we're in a a conundrum as to what to do. Because we would indeed, if we vote for Lady Pinnock's amendment, be voting for something that would send the measure back to the House of Commons and could, if the government refuses to give way, lead to the fall of the bill. That's entirely in, in, in the hands of the government. However, it is manifestly not the case that we're breaking the Salisbury Convention. It's manifestly not the case that we're going against the commitments that the government itself has given, and it's manifestly not the case that we would be the cause of the bill falling. It would be the government that would be the cause of the bill falling because they weren't prepared to accept these amendments. So, my lords, we all have judgments to take as to how to vote, and I respect people who take d different views on this issue, but what is very clear to me is that this is not a matter about the supremacy of the House of Commons, this is, as the noble Earl Lord Lytton said in, uh, I, I have to say, the most impassioned speech I've, I've heard him deliver to the House, this is a matter of the good faith of the government and whether when it says something it means it, and if this House has any role to play, it's to see that high standards of conduct in public life are maintained and that governments are held 
to commitments that they give, and that the ordinary meaning of words should be taken to apply when they're uttered by ministers. Does anyone else in the chamber wish to speak? I call on Lord Greenhalgh to reply to the debate. Uh, my Lords, I'm not going to trade uh, Alice, Wand Alice in Wonderland um, anecdotes with the noble Lord, Lord Adonis, um, but what I will do is take issue with the point that's been made by the noble Lord, Lord Kennedy, and by the noble Baroness, Lady Pinnock, that this government and this Prime Minister has done nothing or sat on, uh, on its hands. Uh, the, the reality is that I was appointed a minister uh, a little over a year ago uh, into, this, into, this, into this role, and the previous government had committed first 400 million, and then very reluctantly an additional 200 million, towards the costs of remediating the very same cladding that was on uh, Grenfell Tower, um, aluminium composite material. And then when I, in the month that I was made a minister, um, the Chancellor committed a further billion. And now a, this uh, Chancellor and this Prime Minister have committed a further 3.5 billion, taking the total funding amount to an unprecedented 5.1 billion. That is simply not correct to say we're doing nothing. That is a considerable sum of money and a massive commitment to recognise that we do need to dampen the impact of the costs of remediating the unsafe cladding that is the major fire accelerant on these buildings so that Grenfell, a tragedy like Grenfell Tower fire never happens again. I would also take issue, and I, I actually really enjoy the contributions by the noble Earl, Earl Lytton. He's a property professional. He did speak with great passion. But the reality is I spent the last year dealing with the coalface of trying to get sometimes some building owners, the tail this is, the tail of building owners that don't want to do the, get on with the remediation, even when the funding is in place. And there are two enforcement routes to get them to move, even when they don't want to. One is the Housing Act 2004, uh, and the other one is the current Fire Safety Order 2005. And, the, and so that it is recognised as an enforcement route, even for external cladding systems, but it's just that some fire and rescue authorities feel that it's too ambiguous, and therefore that ambiguity, that clarification, that operational disagreement between different fire and rescue services, and I say that as Fire Minister, is a significant problem. But one of the reasons why remediation is happening today is because there are these enforcement options in place today, and this uh, this, this very modest three-clause bill is a very sensible clarification of that fire safety order 2005. So, my Lords, we are at an impasse. I am hopeful that we may get this vital bill through because it is important to get that legal clarity that I have referred to. The safety of leaseholders and residents is paramount, and it will be compromised if we do not ensure this bill is placed on the statute book by the end of this session. And tonight is that moment to decide that very fact. The bill falling will not help leaseholders. The bill falling will not make homes safer. Turning to the noble Lord, Lord Kennedy's amendment, this amendment does lack clarity, uh, prohibiting all kinds of remediation costs from being passed on to leaseholders. This means that where costs are minor, as a result of wear and tear, or even where leaseholders are responsible for damage, they would still not be expected to pay, which is not a proportionate response. I think all members would agree that the taxpayer should not be paying for all and every cost associated with remediation. The scope is far too broad to be a sensible solution. In several ways, this amendment has the potential to make things worse for leaseholders. For example, it is unclear on who should take responsibility for remediation works, until a statutory funding scheme is in place to pay for the costs. This would result in all types of remediation being delayed, which is an unsatisfactory outcome for leaseholders. So practically speaking, in respect of the requirement in the amendment to deliver particular requirements to Parliament with 90 and 120 days, we need to be mindful in this regard that drafting legislation is a complex matter, a matter that cannot be dealt with in the time frame proposed by the amendment. But I'm noted that the, um, the noble Lord um, is unlikely to press uh, a division this evening, and I won't go any further, but, but to impose an arbitrary deadline, as stated, is neither helpful nor practical. But let's turn now to the amendment proposed by the noble Baroness Lady Pinnock, 
who has indicated that she wishes to test the will of the House. We see the same key elements of this amendment time and time again, and the other places voted it down time and time again. The same issues apply with this amendment. It lacks clarity, which will lead to delay. The scope is too broad, and there are practical issues. For instance, regardless of blame, regardless of whether this is remediation or wear and tear, it seems like no leaseholder will ever have to pay more than £600 per year. What if a leaseholder is responsible for an attempt at renovations, which is picked up in a fire risk assessment and has damaged part of the building's structure? Is the noble lady really suggesting that, um, uh, that the, the leaseholder should not pay for that? My Lords, a number of you have asked the government to come up with their own wording to deal with this issue. But as I've stated before, the Fire Safety Bill is simply not the right place for these amendments. It does not have the legal underpinning to carry them. This issue does not belong here. So, my Lords, I want to place on record once again this government's commitment to un an unprecedented sum of £5.1 billion to protect leaseholders from the costs of remediating unsafe cladding. We are committed to developing stronger avenues for redress, and we are ensuring that developers contribute through our high-rise levy and developer tax. And in answer to the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Rochester, it is quite clear that the ability to deliver and provide grant will be via the Building Safety Fund, which is in operation today. I can, if it's helpful, put on record that the financing scheme does not have to await any statutory passage of the Building Safety Bill and will be available as a very important way of protecting uh, those uh, leaseholders that are in medium-rise buildings. The only thing that would require the statutory underpinning in terms of supporting leaseholders is the, um, uh, the high-rise levy, which would form part of the regime uh, to collect a levy for those buildings that would be considered high-risk uh, at, at that point, and that would form part of the Building Safety Bill. So much of this does not have to wait. Uh, the, uh, the vast majority of this does not have to wait for, uh, a, uh, for the Building Safety Bill to be passed. The Building Safety Bill will be helpful to strengthen redress and make it clear what charges can be passed through to leaseholders and protect uh, leaseholders from, uh, from, from, uh, from charges that they should not be paying for. So, my, my Lords, um, I want to um, say that this Government always has been and will continue to be committed to delivering the Grenfell Tower inquiry recommendations. I do respectfully urge you to reject uh, the Noble Baroness's amendment. I will reiterate once again that, we, that if we do not move forward with uh, the Fire Safety Bill um, uh, and get it passed tonight, it will fall, and the Government will not be able to deliver the inquiry's recommendations in relation to external walls and flat entrance doors. Ultimately, this means the safety of residents and leaseholders could be compromised. I beg to move. Lord Kennedy of Southwark. My Lords, I thank all noble lords that have spoken in this debate tonight. Um, I think it's worth pointing out for the second day in a row, debating these issues, not a single member of the government's benches have come forward to support the Noble Order Greenhouse or the position of the government. And as I said yesterday, I'm not surprised the position of the government is frankly a disgrace and is totally outrageous. The claim that, um, that you know, we haven't got this amendment right and we haven't got the time, it lacks clarity, I mean, if we were going to accept that as a serious proposition, you know, we wouldn't have had this bill just sitting there for weeks and weeks and weeks and not tabled by the government here. After it, after it was rejected by the government, the comments it could have been put in, you chose not to table it, you left it sitting there. So I really don't think that point holds water. Um, the problem for the Noble Order Greenhouse, of course, is that um, the sums of money pledged, and I accept that they are considerable, does not deliver the, the pledges from the Prime Minister. Or does the promise in pledge Prime Minister count for nothing? I mean, I'll just leave it there. You know, I mean, he makes lots of pledge, promises and pledges. I hope they count for something, but I, or do they count for nothing? If voting again for this uh, amendment, amendment I would change anything, then I would, I would divide the House. But I'm also not prepared to mislead those affected that we can force the government to change this bill. Sadly, the government are not listening. 
and the House prorogues tomorrow. But this issue won't go away. The Government will be forced to do the right thing by the leaseholders, by the campaigners, by the gladiators, by members in this House and the other place. They will be dragged kicking and screaming to do what the leader of their party, the Prime Minister of the UK, pledged, what he promised he would do. I'm going to quote the Prime Minister again. And I think this House will hear this quote again and again and again until the Government do what he pledged. And the Prime Minister told us, we are determined, that's it, we are determined that no leaseholders should have to pay for the unaffordable costs of fixing safety defects that they did not cause and are of no fault of their own. That was the Prime Minister of our United Kingdom, the leader of the Conservative Party, the Right Honourable Boris Johnson MP, on the 3rd of February in a question posed to him by the Leader of the Opposition. That statement from the Prime Minister was made after this bill had been through both houses and three weeks before the Government in the other place rejected our amendments for the first time. The PM's pledge, the PM's promise, the PM's Government voted against his pledge and his promise at every opportunity. The position is frankly ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous, my Lords. What a complete and utter nonsense from the Government. Though, as I said, I will not test the opinion of the House on my motion tonight, but this issue will not go away and the Government will have to live on their pledges and promises. I beg leave to draw my amendment. Is it your Lordship's pleasure that uh, motion A1 be withdrawn? Amendment by leave withdrawn. Baroness Pinnock. Uh, my Lords, I thank all noble Lords for another excellent debate, uh, a fourth in the series, for their, and for their contributions tonight. Um, again, uh, the, the tune from the uh, noble Lord uh, Greenhalgh, the Minister, has not changed. Same old record about this isn't the right bill. Well, if it isn't the right bill, then where is the government's bill to address these horrendous problems that are going to be faced by leaseholders? Where is it to keep the government's promise, the government's pledge that leaseholders would not have to face the unaffordable consequences of fire safety defects. Where is it? And its absence tells us more than anything else about the, the, the government's commitment to help leaseholders. And to then pledge, as the noble lord, the minister has done, that the building safety bill will, will, will pave the way, forgets the fact that bills are now landing on doormats as we speak. Time is of the essence, and still the government refuse to move. It is a thoroughly depressing moment that people can be thrown to the wolves, if you like, in order to, to save the Treasury from paying what they ought to pay and then extracting what they ought to extract from those who have caused the problem the construction scandal, the cladding crisis is theirs and theirs alone. The noble Lord the Minister, and I thank him for his criticisms again of the amendments that I've, I've uh, proposed today. I just wish that he would then do something about it rather than just saying you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, you know, what are you going to do? I've taken heart from the impassioned speech from the noble Earl Lytton. He is an expert in, in the housing field and has frequently in this house shared his expertise. And the fact that he too cannot in all conscience vote for the, the fire safety bill as it stands unamended gives me heart that we have got this uh, in the right place as far as those of us who want to protect people from exorbitant costs of putting right fire safety defects. 
And finally, my lords, um, I just want to, to say one last word. That leaseholders, to remind ourselves that leaseholders are those that have done everything right. Everything right. Saved up for their house, put down the mortgage, budgeted for, for the expenses they anticipate. They have done everything right and nothing wrong. Yet the government, and it seems others in this house, are willing to make them pay the price. That is not acceptable and not something that the Liberal Democrat benches will stand by and let happen if we can help them. It is a depressing moment that I believe that the noble uh, uh, Lord Kennedy has indicated that he will not be prepared to, to vote for the amendment to try and get safeguards for leaseholders. Um, he's thrown in the towel and that I find uh, utterly uh, disappointing and depressing. But with those words, my lords, I'm, I'm prepared to have one more go to try and protect leaseholders and indeed tenants from the awful consequences, unintended consequences of this fire safety bill. And with that, my lords, I, I wish to uh, divide the House, seek the opinion of the House, and I beg to move.